Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You need to be very careful when you hear this coming out of your mouth. Well, I know it's wrong, but. No, there's no I know it's wrong, but. It's just wrong. If God says it's wrong, there's no I know it's wrong, but. It's just wrong. We're going to talk tonight about passing the going through test. We're talking about how we're tested in life. Genesis 16, all the way back in the beginning of the book. Genesis 16, 8 and 9. I feel really good about this word tonight. I think it's going to really help some people. Now, you know the whole situation. I'll kind of give you a fast-forward version. God had promised Abram and Sarah a child, and they'd waited a lot longer than they wanted to wait. So Sarah got a bright idea that she would give her handmaiden to her husband, and her husband could get the handmaiden pregnant, and then she would take that child, and that was how she decided God wanted to do it. Bad idea. The culture was a little different then, but I don't care what kind of a culture it is, you don't give your husband another woman <laughs> and expect it to work. Well, sure enough, Hagar was a sweet little servant until she got pregnant, and then it became, na 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 now I'm pregnant and you're not. Now Abram's going to love me more than you, na 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 So now Sarah gets ticked off, and she begins to mistreat Hagar. So here's Hagar's reaction, verse 8. And he said to Hagar, Sarah's maid. Now this is God talking to her now. Where did you come from? And where are you intending to go? And she said, I'm running away from my mistress. <laughs> Say running away. And I want you to look what God said to her. The angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and humbly submit to her control. God, you cannot be asking me to do that. <laughs> She's mistreating me. It's not fair. It's not right. I talked this morning about running from places where God wants you to stay. You're not doing yourself a favor. You know what? I've been preaching for 32 years, and I got a revelation sitting in my hotel room this afternoon. I love my enemies. Now, I've taught love your enemies, and you know, Luke 6, 34 says, love your enemies. And I'm like, yeah, that's a cool God thing to do. Pray for those that hurt you. And, you know, but I got a different side of it today. I love my enemies. You know why? Because they've made me the woman that I am. I got it. Now I know why God said love your enemies. Is anybody getting it? Love your enemies. They're forcing you to grow up. They're forcing you to mature. They're forcing you to dig in deeper with God. God arranges a lot of uncomfortable things in our life, and it doesn't mean that God wants to hurt us. Actually, He has a goal in mind, and that is to help us. And what people are doing is wrong. What Sarah was doing, mistreating Hagar, was wrong. But God told her to go back and submit to it. And he ended up doing something great for her too. You see, when we run and trying to take care of ourselves, then we end up missing the thing that God would do for us. We frequently see what others are doing to us, but we rarely ever see what we're doing, and that's what God wants to change. 
You didn't hear me, did you? <laughs> we frequently see what other people are doing. Why? Well, I, I can't stay there. You're doing this and you're doing that. And you're doing this and you're doing that. Well, see, maybe there's something in you that God has got to get at. And if you're in a comfortable place, he'll never get to it. In 1 Kings, we see that Elijah on one day made a total fool out of 400 Baal prophets. And the Bible says that he single-handedly slaughtered them. I mean, if you think about that, that had to be a messy ordeal. I mean, you talk about being tired at the end of the day. Because he chopped them up. 400 of them. Lord have mercy. And he was worn out. He was tired. He was exhausted. And Jezebel heard what he did. And she put out a message that she was going to kill him. And he ran, ran. Everybody say he ran. Amen. He ran from one woman. Now come on guys, I want to ask, what's the problem here? <laughs> you can kill 400 evil prophets, but you run from one woman? We got more power than we thought we did. <laughs> he was tired. He wasn't thinking right. He was worn out. And the whole story is really beautiful. He actually got so bad, he just said, I just want to die. Forget it. He's out in the desert. He's out in the desert sitting by himself. If this is the way it's going to be, I just prefer that you kill me. Nobody loves you, God, but me. I'm the only prophet you have left. I'm the only one in my family, God, that's a believer. I just don't think I can do this anymore. <laughs> I'm the only believer at my place of work, God. And I just, you got to get me another job. I just can't be there. You know what you want? You're gonna, you want to go, you say, I want to work in a ministry. Oh, I love it. You've asked God to use you. Now you're the only light in a dark place, and you want to go somewhere and get in a nice little nest where there's no thorns and where you can't help anybody. Elijah's like, I'm the only one, God. I'm the only one left that loves you. And God said, I have got 7,000 prophets that you don't even know anything about that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Now shake it off. And you know what he did? Sent him right back to where he ran from and told him to get back to work. Come on, what have you been running from? Debt, poor health that you could do a lot about if you just would. Not being able to get along with anybody because you've got some issues in your life and you keep wanting everybody out there to be nice so you can be happy. Well, get happy anyway. You're not all smiling. I don't. Well, this doesn't sound like much fun. I came here to get encouraged. Now we got to talk about Jonah. Oh, dear mercy, let us talk about Jonah. You, you got to read three chapters, the whole three chapters to get the story, which we're not obviously going to do that, but I'm going to skip around a little bit so you, you can go or not go. But Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, <laughs> that great city. Proclaim against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee, to run to Tarshish. And if you look, that's the exact opposite direction from where God told him to go. Now. He took a ship that was sailing to this island, Tarshish, which was the most remote of this group of islands. So while he was on the boat, storms, bad storms kept coming up. Well, finally, the sailors all said, hey, look, something's wrong. There's somebody on this boat <laughs> that's got a real issue, and we got to find out what's going on. So. 
They cast lots, which means they drew straws or they rolled dice or whatever they did. That was, I mean, they actually were led by that. But interestingly enough, the lot fell on Jonah. Isn't it interesting what God will do? It's like out of all these people on here, God, and you got a point to me. And so he admitted then that he was probably the problem. They threw him overboard. <laughs> well, the storm ceased. It's amazing sometimes how the storms will cease if you just throw a few things overboard. <laughs> Come on, I'm preaching better than you're acting. <laughs> so while he was out there, God arranged for a whale to swallow him. He's in the whale's belly. It's about the third day. He's covered with seaweed. It's all over him. And he prays. God forgive me and blah, 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 and on and on and on. So God tells the fish, okay, I'm done with you now. Spit him out. Let me tell you something. When God's done with your enemies, he'll deal with them. Did you hear me? I said when God is finished with your enemies, that sometimes he arranges... He'll deal with them. So now, let me find the right verse here because this is too good to pass up. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited out Jonah up on dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time <laughs> saying, arise and go to Nineveh. I love this. I'm just having so much fun, I can't hardly stand it. Now, why did he have to go through all that being in the belly of the whale and getting thrown off the ship and the seaweed and the vomiting and all this? Why did he have to go through that? Because he ran away from what God was telling him to do. And I'm telling you, if you keep running, you're only going to get in a worse mess. And sooner or later, if you want to get things straightened out in your life, you're going to have to go back and to the place where God told you to go. This is so good, I can hardly stand it. Amen. You got to stop running. Sometimes we run from our own sin. King David did that. He committed adultery and murder. And for a whole year, he didn't repent. David was a man of God. He had a very close relationship with God. I'm still trying to figure out how he pulled that off without it just crushing him. But I know what he did. He justified it. That's the way we hide from sin. We excuse it, we reason it out, and we justify it. I'm telling you what, justification, self-justification is so dangerous. You need to be very careful when you hear this coming out of your mouth. Well, I know it's wrong, but. No, there's no I know it's wrong, but it's just wrong. If God says it's wrong, there's no I know it's wrong, but it's just wrong. Amen. I'm actually kind of proud of you guys. I don't think I've lost anybody yet. When you preach like this, some people flee. We haven't had any runners yet, and that's good. You're all at least staying to face the sermon about facing things. Excuses. Well, Nathan finally came and confronted David and his prayer of repentance is in Psalm 51. You should read it sometime. It's just absolutely beautiful. The freedom and the deliverance and the joy that came back to him. and His ministry was restored. He was able to help people just because he confronted his sin. Don't make excuses for sin and don't call it something else. Call it sin. It's not your hang up or your weakness or your thing, <laughs> it's sin. Another way that we hide from sin is through blame. 
These two things are very important, excuses and blame. Excuses and blame. Well, I know we're supposed to give, but forgive, but surely God couldn't expect that, that after what was done to me. Why are you a special case? Hmm. Wow. Well, I know I shouldn't act this way. I know I'm not acting very nice tonight, but I had a bad day at work. <laughs> so, that's when you're supposed to kick it in high gear and be nice even when you don't feel like it. Well, I know I shouldn't act like this, but I don't feel very good. <laughs> well, find that place in Christ where you can live the resurrection life where you're lifted out from among the dead even while you're in the body. Pray a little extra that day. Blame, we see it all over the Bible. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the devil. It goes on to Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah was the one that suggested the thing with Hagar, but you got to keep in mind that Abraham went for it. What does that tell you? You know, Eve gets a bad rap because Adam was in charge in the garden. And when she brought that apple to him, he should have said, no, and you spit out what's in your mouth. We're not going to do this. It's wrong. I mean, it's ridiculous. Him being a man of God, and then he blames it on his wife. And not only that, he said, God, it's that woman that you gave me. That's what it says. The woman that you gave me, she tempted me to eat, and I ate. And then he went to her, and she said, well, the devil made me do it. <laughs> My goodness. Numbers 21, I want us to look at this, verses 4 through 9. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. This is the Israelites when, we were making, when they were making their journey through the wilderness. And the people became impatient, depressed, and very discouraged because of the trials along the way. That's not the right way to respond to trials, by the way. They should have said to each other, don't panic, this is only a test. Hey, we're on our way to the promised land. So what if we run into a few giants along the way? We're giant killers. We don't have to have everything our way. We can be happy anyway. God is good, and we appreciate Moses leading us out of that bondage. But no, look at how they handled it. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? We don't have any bread. There's no water. We hate this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manna. Is that not ridiculous? God was raining food out of the sky. One of the greatest miracles ever in history. And they said, and we're tired of that stuff too. The Lord sent fiery burning serpents among the people. <laughs> and they bit the people and many died. It was just another whale. Only this time it was fiery serpents. Now look at what, look, now look. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Ooh, revelation. Why did 23,000 of them have to die before they got that revelation? Don't lose everything you've got before you get a revelation that God's trying to deal with you. And it's time to listen. Come on, don't lose your marriage before you realize that God's trying to deal with you. Don't lose your kids. Don't lose your sanity. Don't lose your health. Don't lose your joy. Don't lose your peace. 
Don't go around feeling guilty all the time because you won't deal with the Goliath that God's trying to tell you to deal with. Who I like my message about? I may buy a copy for myself. Woo! I think it's the Robin Hood outfit. What do you think? I don't know. It's time to stop running, folks. Now, let me just say one last thing here. Spiritual maturity is the other thing we run from. Just plain old growing up in God. And in John chapter 6, there's a wonderful example of this, but it would probably take me too long to go through it all and get you to understand it. So I'm going to give you a little synopsis, and I just want you to read John chapter 6 for yourself. It's a pretty long chapter, but it's so good, and I think you'll really understand it after I say these things to you. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate manna out in the wilderness, and yet they died. Now, what he was really saying was they had miracles, but that didn't really keep them in faith and keep them close to God. They still died out there. He said, it's not a miracle you need, it's me that you need. It's not having everything you want that you need, it's me that you need. And then he went on to say, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they all thought he was a nutcase. And he was basically saying, take me as your life. Let me be your life. I'm your living bread. I'm your living drink. If you fellowship with me and you require me as your vital necessity in life, then you're always going to be happy because you've got the living bread and the living drink that you need. And then some of the disciples, some of the disciples began to get all upset, and they're like, well, who can be expected to listen to this kind of teaching? This is ridiculous. Eat my body, drink my blood. What are you talking about? And it says, many of them, now listen to this, many of them left and went back to their old associations. I feel like that John chapter 6 is a transition chapter in the Word of God. It's the place where God has said, okay, you've been babies. I've brought water out of the rock. I've parted the Red Sea. I've rained your breakfast out of the sky. I've put up with your nonsense, with your murmuring, your grumbling, your complaining, your blaming. I've nursed you along all these 40 years. Now I'm telling you that your life does not consist in getting your way all the time and having everything you want. It is now time to grow up. It's now time to take me as your life and to seek me for who I am, not just what I can do for you. I said it's time to seek God for who He is and not just what He can do for you. And it said, many of them returned to their old associations. And then he turned to the twelve. There's a reason why the twelve were the twelve. Because there was a lot of disciples, but there were only twelve that were of the inner group. And he turned to the twelve and he said, will you also leave? And Peter looked at him and he said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. To me, that is so beautiful because he's saying, I don't know what we're signing up for here, but whatever it is, we might as well go ahead and go through it because there's nothing to go back to. Come on, is anybody home in God's house tonight? There's nothing to go back to. We're not going to run away from this hard place and run back into a mess that we just got out of. We're willing to grow up. I challenge you in this place tonight, and all that will watch this by TV, hear it by radio, listen by CD, watch by DVD, however God gets this message to you. I'm challenging you to say to God, 
Okay. I'm ready, God, with your help to start confronting issues in my life. Don't spend your time trying to change somebody else. You start working with God and let him change you. Well, when we run from difficult things in our life, we're always gonna come back and have to face those things eventually. God doesn't want us to run away from things. He wants us to be strong in Him and know that we can go through things. One of the things I always say about God is in His school, you never fail. You just get to keep taking the same test over and over until you pass it. You know, we need to take responsibility for our actions. We don't wanna make excuses or blame other people. That's part of learning how to be spiritually mature. 